Hey, I'm so glad to be welcomed back into your home. Um, all over the place, homes are gathering. Um, people are getting together to worship Jesus. Of course, this is a worldwide phenomenon. But it's so fun to hear uh, what's going on with, with our broadcast that we're putting out there. We've seen, I'm getting notes from people, a lot of my own family members, so hello family out there, that are cousins and, and aunts and uncles watching and really appreciate that. If you're local at all, would you come out on Sunday night to our church property in Issaquah? We have a worship night planned. So, this, and this is something you can bring people to. You need to go to issaquah.cc slash tent to find the details because we're doing it in a way that is compliant with all of the state and county regulations. Um, so up to 100 people can meet. Um, we're going to have hand sanitizer out. Uh, you touch only your chair. We're going to maintain social distance, stay six feet apart. But we are going to sing and worship. And I'm going to share a few words as well around unity and spiritual warfare. And then you can bring a word to share too, bring a passage of scripture, um, but we'll be able to sing out. So that, that starts at seven o'clock this Sunday night, um, but you can arrive early around 6.30 to kind of get things settled because if we get a maximum capacity crowd, we're going to have to figure those things out. But we had a great time last week doing that. Uh, we had about, I don't know, 50 or 60 people. Um, I didn't actually do a count, but it was really, really nice to see people together. So put your masks on keep your distance and all that kind of stuff. Really respect if, if people are there, they're probably wondering, okay, is everybody going to keep me safe? And so, yeah, we need to keep each other safe in that. But, um, but that's, that's an encouragement to you. Um, the food delivery ministry is going really well. The Quick Reaction food team, uh, you heard a report last week, is going strong. So we still need you to show up and bring on Tuesday afternoons at 3 um, your donations that we're going to put into these different boxes and send them out. Um, God's doing some really neat things there. So be praying for that today. Let me pray for us as we get into our worship time. And I'm just going to ask that God would um, center our hearts on Jesus, that by his spirit we would experience the closeness that, that we have. I mean, we are gathered right now um, and we're just gathered in different homes, but we're with each other in spirit and by the spirit. So what we want to see you is in the comment sections, um, just saying, hey, this is where I'm calling, you know, this is where I'm dialing in from, or this is where I'm, I'm at, and this is who's watching with me, and any comments or questions, because we would love to interact with you in there. But let me pray for you. God of mercy, God of justice, God of holiness, but God our Father, the Father of justice, the, our Holy Father, our merciful Father, our loving Father, would you pour yourself out to us today? On this Father's Day weekend, many of us are experiencing a loss, many of us are experiencing great joy, but we know that you alone are the Father from whom all families derive their name. And we want you, Father, to be exalted today. We ask that you would reign supreme in our hearts, that you would help us center our thoughts around Jesus, that you would give us the experience of the gathered, even while we are in uh, separate homes, and that by your Spirit you would unite us. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Hi, ICC. This is Jared and Linnea with you. Welcome to our living room uh, where we'll be doing worship and uh, we're excited to do it with you. And so uh, as we start to sing together, I just want to encourage you uh, knowing that we are singing together. And you can't hear the voices of other people in their living rooms or wherever you might be watching, but just know that when we sing together, uh, God is pleased. And so uh, it's a word of encouragement for you as we begin to sing. And the song is Christ Our Hope in Life and Death.
truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us night unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Hey, I've got a tip for you. Read the Bible like it's fiction. <laughs> Wait, you're a Bible teacher. <laughs> you're telling me to read it like it's fiction. Yep, read it like it's fiction. And this is, this is why I say that. It's a borrowed idea, but I want you to think of it this way. Um, when we're reading the Bible, sometimes we see these details that pop up and we're like, oh, I don't know what that means. Must be superfluous, must be extra, must be unnecessary. And so we just move on. Think of it this way. If you're reading fiction and the author is trying to get you to understand the intricacies of the story, um, he may say something like this. Joe went to the store to buy milk. As Joe was walking down the street, he noticed a shadowy figure in the alley. He shook it off and thought it was nothing as he walked to the store. He grabbed his milk and went home. Now, when we're thinking about that in, a, in the Bible, we just go like, oh, Joe walked to the store. Hmm, I don't know what that is. And then he keeps going. But if, if we're reading the Bible like it's fiction, and of course it's not, this is the inspired word of God. But if we're reading it like it's fiction, we're reading like the author is laying some things in there that I need to understand. <laughs> And I should know about that. So we can't just go through the Bible and read something and go, da, 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 da. Oh, I don't know what that means. And then, oh, just keep, just keep going and expect the story to make sense, right? The shadowy figure in the alley is foreshadowing, right? It's the, the, the idea the author is trying to get you to understand is that this is going to come up soon. He doesn't just throw in those details just for grins, right? So we need to be thinking about that. 
Now, speaking of shadows, um, we are sons and daughters of the Enlightenment. Uh, whether you like it or not, we grew out of this uh, movement in history hundreds of years ago um, where, where we say, oh, there's no shadows. We can explain that shadow we figure in the alley. It's uh, nothing. It's, it's, it's nothing. No, no big deal. And we just kind of move through our life with our, with our science and our arts and our reason and our focus on the individual, trying to get uh, the Enlightenment, tried to get this universal answer for everything that's going on through reason. And we've gone off the rails. Um, we've, been, uh, we've been looking for infallible truths, but not using history, not looking back, not using any sense of tradition or experience. Um, it turns out we end up with this crazy set of beliefs that there is, you know, we, we think, oh, there's no, no such thing as supernatural. There's no such thing as spiritual. It's only material. Um, and in this humanist approach to progress, we've lost completely the understanding of the supernatural world. And I know that I, uh, I struggle with that sometimes. I mean, so, so you, you get it, right? At some level, you understand that there's a supernatural thing going on, even with your faith, even with Christianity. But because, well, I, we believe in a resurrected Messiah who has ascended to sit at the right hand of the throne of God. Huh? That sounds pretty supernatural. And uh, so we're already bought into this. But today's passage in Ephesians um, is going gonna, is gonna, to, we're going to be walking to the store and then we're going to look down a little alley and see uh, a shadowy figure. And instead of just going past it, I want to unpack that for you. I think I owe that to you as a Bible teacher. And you deserve it as a, a student of the Bible to figure out where does all this fit. So I think you're really going to enjoy um, our little journey today. So, but let's, let's, let's take our walk to the store. Let's go buy some milk and let's just see what, what gives here. So he says, of this gospel, the gospel that we looked at last week, this mystery that now Gentiles though, uh, were, God, were uh, following all sorts of other gods um, are now on, in the same family as Jewish people who followed the one true God. And that's a very strange thing. They were on very different trajectories, uh, idol worshiping and and uh, and running in, in ignorance, sons of disobedience. And the Jews were the, the holders of the, the promise of the Messiah now revealed in Jesus Christ. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Then he says in verse 8, To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints... This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light, to enlighten for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold or multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus, King Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Okay, so here's the, here's the nonfiction read of it. We say, um, okay, Paul sees that he was very least of the saints. Well, he says that over and over because he persecuted the church. He doesn't feel like one of the right, he doesn't feel like he's in the right place being lavished with all this riches. He thinks he's the least of saints because he, he was actually persecuting this way. But I've been given this grace to preach the gospel and to bring to light for everyone. Right, preach the gospel. Everyone. Um, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? And then verse 10 is the center of this. So that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God might be now be made known to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The whole church is the channel through which God is going to make known his wisdom to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Well... Who, who are these authorities, and where do they rule, and for how long? Those are the three questions I want to work through. So, who are the authorities, where do they rule again, and for how long? So, let's first just go with where, uh, where are these authorities. Well, it says in the heavenly realms. Something hidden in God 
now is made known in the heavenly realms. Well, I figured everybody in the heavenly realms would know what God is doing because he embodies the heavenly realms, but apparently he's kept this secret. <laughs> you know, now we've, we've typically understood the spiritual realm as being God and his angels, uh, you know, the Trinity and the angels and Satan and his demons, you know, like these two warring forces. But, but there is a lot more going on there. And apparently... Uh, not everybody was in on the whole plan. Maybe, maybe you have echoes of this, as shadows down the, down the alley, where you were thinking, oh yeah, I remember hearing something like, uh, the angels long to look into these things. Like, what is going on? What is God up to? As if maybe he hadn't opened it up to everybody. Well, yeah, that's interesting. And oh, what about that statement in Colossians where if they had known, if the, if the dark powers had known that Christ was going to rise from the dead and ascend to the throne and, and rule everything now, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But apparently there was some secret here. These secret plans were made secret um, even from those uh, in the heavenly realms. It was kept in God. Isn't, isn't that what it says here? It says, the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that the church, through the church, the manifold, ma the wisdom of God might be known, made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this is what God had always planned. Okay, so many of you know uh, Satan and demons, you, you think about that, but where, where do they dwell? They, they, uh, demons aren't, aren't the ones that inhabit idols. Uh, they don't reside under the earth. Um, they're, they're not in the heavenlies. So <laughs> the, the, apparently there's, there's something going on in the geography of the cosmic world that we need to understand. And I'm not going to take a deep dive into it, but I do want to open it up. And, and this would be a great time for you to ask questions. You can ask them in the comments. Um, you can hang out with us in our lobby afterward on Zoom and, and we can talk about these things. But I want to open up something to you called cosmic geography. Okay, um, so this is what and we know from New Testament writings that go back into the Old Testament as well about these different Greek words that have different meanings and different usages. So I'll step aside a little bit so you can you can see a little bit bigger picture here. Um, but we've got rulers. We've got um, archon, right? Principalities, okay? Powers and authorities. That's our word in, in this passage. Exousia, powers, dunamis. Uh, dominions, lords, curios, thrones, and world rulers. These are all um, phrases that, that have different sorts of uh, meaning throughout the New Testament. Now, exousia is the term most frequently used in the New Testament for um, power bestowed by an office. And these are, these are, there's human offices like that, but then there's also divine beings, um, spiritual powers that are considered on thrones over some domain and, and have authority. Now, this is linked back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, 8 and 9, where God divided up the nations and split their languages and all that, and then sent them under the rulership of sons of God, of Ben Elim, of of divine beings who inhabit the spiritual world and had power over them. Um, this was actually a very common understanding in ancient times, um, that this nation had their God, this nation had their God. What I've only come to understand in the last few years is that that was God's plan that he would divide things up that way. Uh, I know you look at these books all the time. Um, let me open Plato. So this was all 400 years before Jesus. And I don't read Plato to say, this is the divine truth. I'm just saying that it was common, commonly understood that this is how things went. Um, here in, in the dialogues to Critias, he says, In the days of old, the gods had the whole earth distributed among them by allotment. There was no quarreling, for you cannot rightly suppose that the gods did not know what was proper for each of them to have, or knowing this, that they would seek to procure for themselves by contention that which more properly belonged to others. They all of them, by just apportionment, obtained what they wanted and peopled their own districts. And when they had, when they had peopled them, they tended us, their nurslings and possessions, as shepherds tended their flocks, excepting only that they did not use blows or bodily force as shepherds do. 
but governed us like pilots from the stern of the vessel. <laughs> anyway, he goes on and he talks about how different gods had different attitudes and all that kind of stuff. That, that was just the common understanding. If you look back at all the different origin stories um, of, of mankind, you see that this nation has their gods, this nation has their gods. But at some level, then, this were the divine family of God that was then allowed to rule. But they ruled corruptly. They ruled unjustly. And so I want to take you to uh, Psalm 30 or Psalm 82. Psalm 82. Uh, Psalm 82 says, um, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So some, some have said, well, these gods are human rulers. Um, um, but that doesn't make a lot of sense because the divine council, if you just if we move over in, to Psalm 89, um, it says, Who in the skies can be compared to Yahweh? Who among the heavenly beings is like Yahweh? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and, and awesome above all who are around him. This is, a, this is a divine throne room scene where God is calling those who have ruled the other nations to account. Now remember why they rule the other nations. God said, I'm going to send all the nations packing. They are not pursuing me, and I'm going to start over with one man. Abraham will be my inheritance and my people, my possession, and then I am going to um, start a family through him, through which all nations on the earth will be blessed. That's Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 3. So we have Genesis uh, 10 is the table of nations. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel, where God divorces them, sends them packing, and then starts over with one man and woman and creates an inheritance among them. So that's the apportionment. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 says that, that, that God sent them out, but Israel is his portion. So they are now under the rule of all these other divine family, but God Yahweh takes one people and makes them his possession. And then through them, all nations of the world are blessed. So here's what Psalm 82 says about how well they did ruling these other nations. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. So he's calling them to account for their terrible job, giving justice, uh, of not giving justice to the poor and the fatherless, the weak, but um, preferring the wicked people and allowing wickedness to reign in their, um, in their nations, that, in those people groups that they've been uh, in charge of. Of course, Yahweh had his plan, and we read it through the whole Bible. This is how you're going to be a people for my name so that all other nations will see what a, good, what a good God I am, and my name will be exalted, and then all nations will come and see that Yahweh alone is to be worshipped. But these other... These other powers called other people to worship them instead of the one true God. And so you see this degradation. You see it in Romans chapter 1 as well. Okay, now they're worshiping idols, and so they give themselves up to lusts and sensualities and wickedness, right? So they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. So verse 6, Psalm 82, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Right? You're my divine family, but guess what? Nevertheless, like men you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Right? Your inheritance, your possession was, was Jacob, was um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their family, and now you're going to inherit all the nations. And how is that process going to take place? How is it going to be that that God takes over and brings his rule and reign over all people. Well, we see that in the Christ, the royal Messiah figure who comes on the scene, right? As he comes, the demons start going, whoa, 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 is this a little bit before the time? Are you, are you seriously going to come and, and send us to the abyss right now? Because it seems a little early for that. And uh, he said, be quiet. You know, don't, don't even talk right now. And he'd cast them out. And so there was this power, this power against darkness coming in the work of Jesus. So, so who are these authorities? Well, they are 
divine beings and then some sort of bureaucratic structure underneath them that rule the nations and are in charge, but have been corrupted and corrupting, and the foundations of the earth now are shaken. So they, where do they rule? Well, they rule in the heavenlies, right? And they rule in, in such a way that, that their earthly counterparts are corrupted and evil as well. And they rule in all of these different regions, over all these different people. Um, they They've created societal structures that are that are in their their image, flat, boring, monochrome, right? Uh, all just peoples by themselves, fearing outsiders, uh, one dimensional, and they marginalize and kill people or groups that don't fit into their narrow band of acceptability. That's the way it goes. And so, these cosmic intelligences are to blame for for humanity's descent into idolatry. So now these these rulers have have called worship to themselves. And and so now social injustice and misery and corruption and poverty and self-destruction follows on. And it's fed and propelled by powers of darkness, which are very much superior to humans right now. But remember, God is creating a human family that he will then exalt to sit on the throne with him and rule over all things. That's that's our destiny. Now, in, in Daniel chapter 10, maybe th this is one of those ones you read once, and then it was that shadowy figure down the alley, and you said, I, I don't know about that. Well, in Daniel chapter 10, um, Daniel's been praying and fasting. He's stuck in, in Babylon. Uh, at this point, he's now Persia, um, and because Persia's taken over. And he's praying and praying and praying, and no answer has been coming. And the answer he gets, he gets it in a vision, Daniel chapter 10, um, Verse 8, so I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed. I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, right? So this man uh, figure shows up, and he's clothed in linen, and he's shining, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in, the, in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and said, um, and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I've been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. So this is a maybe an angelic type figure. An angel just means messenger, so he's a messenger of God coming to bring an answer to prayer. Think about that. Think about when you're praying right now. This is not an aside. This is not an, uh, something extra. This is, this is serious. When you're praying right now over the chaos in our nation, over the hurt in people's hearts, over the, the degradation, over the slurs, over all that, as you're praying and you're aching and you're just saying, oh God, when will you come? Arise, oh God, judge the earth for you will inherit all the nations. As you're praying, and I hope you're praying those kind of things and, and, and deep, deep longing for God to work. You say, where is God? What is he doing? Why doesn't he send a messenger? Well, here, check this out. So he says, uh, O oh man, Daniel, greatly loved, don't fear. Um, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I've come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. Okay. I'm sorry, you didn't get my message? No, uh, I wasn't able to deliver it in time because the king of Persia, the kings of Persia, or the, the prince of Persia, um, was withstanding me. The prince of the kingdom of the Persia withstood me for 21 days. What? We could, we could just go past that, but there are territorial divine beings that are so far above us that even angels can't get through unless they go appeal to one of the great princes, Michael, one of the great princes over Israel, over God's inheritance, come and do it. Do you, do you, do you sense that there's something else going on up here of cosmic significance? There's something else going on when you pray that you don't see. 
You know, we talk about how um, if God doesn't answer your prayer right away, then maybe it's uh, maybe it's wait. You know, He answers yes, no, or or wait. Um, yeah, that's true. Sometimes He answers yes, and He sends a messenger, and the messenger gets caught up in some serious traffic. 21 days worth of traffic um, until he's able to fight his way through because Daniel's in a foreign land and and it's ruled by these kings. And this is why it's so important for us to think. It's so important for us to understand that Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And th through his death and resurrection, he has conquered all these enemies. He has put them to open shame, triumphing them over the cross. And he's created his new family of holy ones to rule and reign with him, to bring his kingdom down. This is, this is super important stuff. Remember, um, who had rightful authority over all the nations? Well, all these other gods, they had their apportionment. And apparently Satan is the one, because he was the one who plunged all of humanity into death, rules over all of them. Remember when Jesus was tempted, he was taken, sent out into the wilderness and he was tempted and Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world if he would just bow down and worship him. Bow down and worship me, says Satan, and you will have all the nations of the world. Well, Jesus had a plan. He knew what his plan was. The Father and the Son and the Spirit had developed this plan. Apparently not many others knew what was going on. And he was going to be crucified, raised from the dead, and exalted to the right hand, and now made ruler over all nations. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, says Jesus. Therefore, go make disciples, right? So this, this rule, so who are the authorities? Well, there's all these different layers of principalities and powers and authorities and thrones and, and, and uh, rulers over all these different things. But where do they rule? Well, they rule in the heavens, um, in that space that we we just don't see, it's it's not necessarily on some distant. It's not like a distant planet. It's it's all around us, right? And they they rule over the terrain that they've had, but then now they've been dethroned. So for how long? How long will they rule? Well, they've been dethroned. They've their authority has been taken away. So now we can go to all the nations and say. You no longer have to worship those gods. You no longer are under their authority. You can now call to Jesus. That's what we see in Acts chapter 17. Uh, for those of you that are aware of that, um, that's where Paul says, he, God overlooked these times of ignorance that, that, he, that you have been experiencing. He knows that, that you have been um, underneath these different authorities, but now he's called one man to... Um, to be the ruler, and he's exalted him by the resurrection so that you know that he is the one to put your focus on. So, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, therefore go and make disciples and recre reclaim all the peoples, right? So in Genesis 11, we see the Tower of Babel. Um, we see, uh, in Genesis 10, we see all these different nations. What, what would be curious for you to do is to go through, look at all those nations, um, and I'll, I'll show you an image here, you get all the nations mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, this table of nations. Uh, and then look at what happened in Acts. All of these nations start to get touched on. Every single nation from Genesis chapter 10 is now in, Genesis, in, Acts chapter, uh, or in the book of Acts. Now remember, um, in Genesis chapter 11, the tongues were divided. And everybody was divided. And then in Acts chapter 2, divided tongues come and rest and people start speaking in languages. And it goes throughout. The only, the only nation from Genesis 10 that's not mentioned in Acts is Tarshish, Spain. And what do we know in Paul's writings after he's gone through in Acts and he's reached all these different nations, where does he long to go? Well, he longs to go to Spain. Because I think in his mind, he is trying to wrap up this all call to the nations. Now, of course, there are further nations than that. But I think for Paul, that was his mindset. I've got to get to Spain. I want to continue. I want to, I want to close down this thing that all the nations that were divided can now come, um, come to me. So, so this verse 10 <clears throat> In, Acts, or in, in Ephesians chapter 3 is, is just critical. I want to read it to you again. Um, he's, verse 9, he's bringing to light, uh, enlighten for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in the God who created all things, so that through the church 
the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that was realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. So that verse 10 is probably one of the most powerful statements for why the church exists. Because these rulers that we saw around the throne room in, in Acts, uh, Psalm 82, they need to be shown what true justice and true humility and true mercy looks like. And it's going to be done through Jesus and through his people. The, they, they must be confronted with God's wisdom and all of its richness. Uh, and this is going to happen through the church. And not just through what the church says. Uh, that's important. But through the, what the church is, a community in which men and women, um, children from every ethnicity, every color, every social and, and cultural background come together in glad worship of the one true God. That is actually putting on display. That's putting it in the face of the authorities, saying God alone is worthy of worship and praise. So by by the church's very existence, think about the portent of this, the importance uh, by the church's very existence, it's supposed to be a warning to the rulers and authorities that their time is up. Uh, and it, it's certainly an announcement to the world that there's a new way to be human. So think about that. Have we as the church in Issaquah um, exposed to the authorities that their time is up? And have we exposed to the world around that there's a new way to be human? connected with God, um, with heaven, you know, seated in the heavenlies, feet firmly planted on earth, walking out this kingdom lifestyle. So there's something truly cosmic, uh, truly cosmically significant that's going on in the church, that we're participating in this grand plan of God to unite all things under Christ's headship um, and make this known to the heavenly powers and put it in their face. So we, we are declaring war by doing this. We're declaring war and declaring that their time is up by preserving the unity. God has won a unity for us. He's preserved it. So, we, so he's given it to us and we now preserve it. And that is a declaration of war, which means if you've been experiencing what I've been experiencing, division and thoughts and, and uh, suspicion and, and all those things, if you've been experiencing that, where is that coming from? Well, it's not coming from God because he's given us a unifying person in Jesus to focus on. So we declare war by preserving the unity, by being silent no longer, right? We, we are now proclaiming the kingship of Jesus by the wisdom of the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing the kingdom of justice and mercy to bear. We are walking this out. And the foundations of the world will no longer be shaken, like Psalm 82 says. They will be upheld because the, the justice is given to the weak and to the marginalized and to the fatherless. So, um, so that's what you need to know. So declaring war by preserving the unity, um, by being silent no longer, um, proclaiming the kingship of Jesus. And I just want to say one more thing. As the kingdom of God expands, as it takes new terrain, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Right? It's gonna, and, and it's no coincidence that, that the, the expulsion of demons from people and places came along with the announcement of the kingdom of God. As the kingdom of God grows the kingdom of darkness shrinks and loses ground. So here we are, the church. We have three main tasks, worship, oneness, and witness. Worship, oneness, and witness. And it's our job to, put, to live that out in such a way that the authorities say, our time is up. And that the people here say, wow, that's a new way to be human.
as we think about um, Jesus' death and burial and resurrection and ascension, not to mention his appearances, but um, as we think about that and as we celebrate that in our time of communion or the Lord's Supper or the, the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, um, I just want to read a little bit of, of the passage here. Um, Paul is very concerned about the church in Corinth because, <laughs> craziest thing, he actually hears that there are divisions among the church. And he's stunned by it. He's like, what do you think Jesus did? What, there's division among you? You've got, you got people that are being um, looked past, and you've got people that are being despised, and you've got people that are being humiliated. Uh, there are factions. Uh, it's, it's, it's craziness. So I just want to read uh, this passage to you as we, as we prepare to take our elements. Um, For what I received from the Lord, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Somehow it always comes down to the cross. It comes back to the cross, this, this central point in history when God's love was shown for us, when, when it was shown what the world would do with a a genuinely perfect human being, he would kill it. Jesus drew these spiritual authorities out of their, <laughs> out of their <laughs> dens, right? And he called them out and, and picked a fight with them, and they all came around him at the cross and thought they were winning the war, thought they had destroyed God's plan, but no, in fact, the shedding of the blood was a new covenant. He says in the same way when he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, so as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you preach the Lord's death until he comes. And that's why we have to be so careful that we, we don't eat the bread and drink the cup in an unworthy manner, allowing division, calling it communion, but allowing division. You've got to examine yourself, eat the bread and drink the cup in a, in a way that says, oh, I, I am clean before man and before God. I have nothing that I need to, um, to resolve be, between other, other people. Um, if you don't do that, your... Um, your life is going to start to have the foundations shaken. Because we proclaim a new covenant and we proclaim Jesus as Lord. He is so worthy of all of our time, all of our attention.
just the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. We pray that God would richly bless you um, until we meet again. And, and I'm hoping that you'll take advantage of our little digital lobby. We have a Zoom meeting um, right after each service and a chance to, to share and shake hands and, um, and tell stories and respond to what God's been doing in our hearts. So hope to see you there.